Playing games handheld is the most fun you can have with your hands. Apart from eating a dozen hard-boiled eggs, of course. Wait, what did you think I meant there? The origins of handheld gaming goes back quite a bit further than the Nintendo Game Boy and Atari Lynx in 1988. After Mattel found incredible success with a series of single game electronic handheld toys like Football in 1977, companies like Coleco, Bandai, Parker Bros and Milton Bradley all released similar products. However, it was Milton Bradley who eventually developed and distributed the Microvision in 1979 and spawned the first true handheld game console, as it was the first to offer interchangeable cartridges. Other than the Epoch Game Pocket Computer, Joe, put that on screen, it doesn't seem like it's right. Is that right? It's not, they didn't really call it that, did they? In 1984, handheld gaming as we know it today didn't truly take off until 1988. What's amazing is just how many different handhelds were released after Nintendo proved the market for such systems and games was viable. As we start ranking these handheld systems, you'll find that companies like Sega, SNK, Bandai and Nokia are among the many who try to create another juggernaut handheld video game console and more often than not came up a little bit short. It's an incredible history. We've gone from the very simplistic, even crude microvision to a combination of a portable and home console hybrid like the Nintendo Switch or the extremely impressive Steam Deck, which can be its own kind of Switch, but we never actually said that and we were never actually here. <coughs> the technology behind handheld gaming has come so staggeringly far between 1979 and the present day and is only going to keep barreling forward. You'll see just how far this technology has truly come as we rank the best handhelds of all time. Before that though, if you want to win yourself a free Steam key, all you have to do is comment 31k gang down below and we'll pick a winner next Friday. Also, sorry if I have a bit of a weird moment and for some reason put the Nokia N-Gage in this list of the best handhelds of all time. I'm currently quite unwell and a little bit sick. Ugh. Number 20, the Nokia N-Gage. What? What? No, we didn't get number one and number 20 mixed up, but I know, I could see why you'd think that. I could see why you'd think that, yeah. On paper, the Nokia, or Nokia if you're feeling more democratic, N-Gage really wasn't the worst idea for a variety of reasons. In 2003, mobile gaming was just beginning to develop into something more elaborate than Snake. Although that was obviously the pinnacle of the industry as we know it. However, when it came to the execution of this device, everything that could have gone wrong absolutely did. Nokia wanted to take on the Game Boy Advance and even promoted themselves in gaming spaces, but shot themselves in the foot almost immediately by charging a full $100 more than the GBA. It was an aggressively average phone with a clunky design, mushy cell phone-like buttons and some of the worst games ever made, including ports from big franchises like Tomb Raider, Tony Hawk Pro Skater and Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. Despite promoting the hell out of their little device, Nokia's N-Gage never really went anywhere. It sold poorly, never even got close to the Game Boy Advance, and was put out of its misery in 2006 after a lifespan of just three miserable years. The Nokia N-Gage is a memorable example of a good idea with dismal execution, but it's still worth seeking out today as at least a weird little curio of sorts. Do you want to see us do a video on the N-Gage? Let us know down below. Don't don't all of you rush down there at once. Number 19, the Tapwave Zodiac. Released on November 1st, 2003, the Tapwave Zodiac was another device looking to take advantage of the rising interest in mobile gaming. The handheld console promised to be more than just a phone and promoted itself to teens and young adults alike as a hub for all of your gaming, photos, videos and music needs and all that other rad stuff that you've liked back in 2003 like, I don't know, Good Charlotte? Remember them? Good Charlotte. There you go. Two models were made in total, the Zodiac 1 with 32 megabytes of space for $299 and the Zodiac 2 with 120 megabytes of space for $399. Crikey almighty. Save some megabytes for NASA, my guys. Despite the hefty price tag, Tapwave Zodiac promised a robust library of games, including Doom 2, Duke Nukem Mobile and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. We may never see much of Tony Hawk these days, but you really can escape him for about a decade there. The problem with the Zodiac was that the promise of more games never really came. 
it was another device where the phone part was acceptable with the console itself earning rave reviews and even some industry awards but the crucial gaming side of things was downright anemic when it came to new titles. As it soon became apparent, the Zodiac just didn't have the financial resources or name value to compete with Nintendo's DS or the PlayStation Portable. By the summer of 2005, just like the Zodiac Killer until about 2013, it was gone. Number 18, the MB Microvision. Debuting in 1979, a full decade ahead of the Game Boy, what really doomed the MB Microvision was being too ahead of the curve for its own good. Despite selling reasonably well in the beginning, the Microvision suffered from a number of headaches. The screen was painfully small, and very, very few games were made before it was discontinued in 1981. It's believed that only 12 were ever released, including Bowling, Connect 4, and Pinball Crikey. The games were extremely simple, as you might have guessed, so there wasn't a whole lot of replay value either. The MB Microvision also suffered from a deterioration issue known as Screen Rot, and isn't that just an incredibly charming name? It basically means that liquid crystal is spontaneously leaking and permanently darkening the screen itself, resulting in a microvision that still technically plays, but you can't really see anything. Neat. Finally, no one really wanted to make games for it. The major companies at the time more or less ignored the MB Microvision until its death in 1981, and that would be it for handheld gaming for the most part until the end of the decade. Number 17, the Atari Lynx. The Atari Lynx was originally developed by Epix, but financial difficulties forced the company to seek out a partner who knew what they were doing. Epix couldn't find anyone, so they just went with Atari instead. Atari agreed to handle production and marketing, and when Epix declared bankruptcy by the end of 1989, Atari effectively owned the entire product. They would release 70 free games for the system in total, which promised to be a 16-bit wonder of sharp graphics, beautiful sound, and some of the most impressive games available at the time. To be sure, it was more powerful than Nintendo's Game Boy, but the Game Boy embraced simplicity and benefited from doing so particularly from the fact that it only took four AA batteries to run the little guy for up to 10 plus hours. The Atari Lynx, by comparison, took more batteries and lasted for a lot less time. The game library had some good titles, including Ninja Gaiden, Chips Challenge and Clax, which is always fun to say, but also some serious stinkers like Batman Returns and Pit Fighter. Ugh. The Lynx just didn't have Nintendo's momentum or a little game called Tetris, but it did manage to hang on all the way to 1995, selling just 2 million units. Would you like to see us do a list on the best Atari Lynx games? Be sure to let us know down below. Number 16, the Watara Supervision. Marketing itself as a cheaper alternative to the Game Boy, the Watara Supervision debuted in 1992 at a price tag of $49.95. That was approximately 40 bucks less than the cost of a Game Boy at that same time. The games were also cheaper and unfortunately were almost universally uninteresting to the vast majority of the Supervision's target market. Yet the Supervision was a pretty interesting little system. Despite receiving very little third-party developer support, which gave the Supervision very little to pit against Nintendo's massive catalogue of homegrown heroes like Mario and Link and third-party superstars such as Castlevania or Mega Man, the system itself could do neat things like hook itself up to your television. Pfft, I'll never catch on. Never catch on. The games for the Supervision in particular were numerous, with some 65 titles like Pac-Boy and Mouse and Superblock being made available over the span of a single year, but they also weren't that interesting. Critics at the time just couldn't see the value of saving money on a handheld if the games were going to be mediocre at best. Several third-party titles were in the pipeline for 1993, but nothing materialised and the supervision was all but forgotten by the middle of the decade. Number 15, the Playdate. Ah yes, Portland the Handheld. Honestly, there was a temptation to rank the Playdate just a little bit higher because it's a weird freak of a thing, but ultimately we're starting to get into handheld consoles that are pretty important for the industry as a whole. The Playdate is a modern handheld console that features a unique crank design with a 1-bit display and no backlight. It's as simple as simple gets, and currently retails for a surprisingly high $199 Edinos. This is a fairly simple console, and this is reflected in the types of games it can play. 
So why does the Playdate perform so well on a handheld console ranking? Because its design choices are honestly quite clever, particularly the crank in its function as an analog controller, and there are quite a few extremely creative games to play on this open source console that anyone can make games for. Playdate has its own little indie ecosystem that's been keeping fans engaged with truly singular titles that can't be experienced anywhere else, including Island, The Botanist, Gun Trails, and many more. It's received good reviews too, and that's certainly nice to see in an age of bloated AAA budgets. It might not be for everyone, and you're going to look a little bit wanky whipping this out in front of friends, but those looking for a singular gameplay experience may want to give this bit of weird a nice little look. Number 14, the Turbo Express. Released in Japan and North America in late 1990 as a handheld console that could play Turbo Graphics 16 games on the go, the Turbo Express is one of the most technically impressive handhelds on this list. The Turbo Graphics 16 was home to tons of great games that just didn't get their due because of the relative obscurity of the console, such as the Bonk series, Splatterhouse, several games in the East series, and a whole lot more. It was an impressive system that just couldn't compete with Nintendo or Sega, and it's unfortunate that Turbo Express didn't move the needle for NEC either. With a backlit display that could display 64 sprites and 481 colours at once, which was a lot for the time, the Turbo Express was an astonishing effort to tackle the Game Boy when a prototype known as Game Tank, that's a cool name, should have stuck with that, was first shown off in 1990. The system was released in December of that year, at a point where the Turbo Graphics 16 had a solid library behind it. Unfortunately, this was still a console that was, by and large, ignored by most people. It also didn't help that the Turbo Express, as you might have guessed, was an even more ravenous battery hog than the Genesis Nomad. It was also ridiculously expensive, retailing for $299 Edinos. That's a full 200 bucks more than a Game Boy would have cost you, and only a little less than what you can get an LCD Steam Deck for now. Despite poor sales, the system managed to hang on until 1994 and has become a bit of a cult favourite. Do you want to see us cover more of the Turbo Express or maybe the Turbo Graphics 16? Be sure to let us know down below. Number 13, Genesis Nomad. Most of us recall that Sega had a handheld console in the form of the Game Gear, but did you know there was a successor and that it could play actual Genesis cartridges? Given this is still the mid-90s we're talking about, this is going to be either an amazing way ahead of its time concept that Sega undernourished, or a spectacular rapid failure that Sega sunk a ridiculous amount of resources into. It's more of the former in this case, with the Genesis Nomad offering a better experience than you might think, but it also suffered some clear issues, coupled with a lack of forward-thinking support that sometimes befell Sega's console projects. Released in North America in 1995, the Genesis Nomad was something of an ancestor to the Switch, given that the Nomad was built for on-the-go play, but could also be docked and played on your television as well. And guess what? It did both of those things pretty well. I mean, not great like, because it ate through six AA batteries in an alarmingly rapid fashion, like some sort of radioactive kaiju, and it wasn't really portable because Genesis cartridges are kinda massive but it was nevertheless a commendable release late into the Genesis lifespan. And that was the problem. The Genesis was all but an afterthought by 1995, and even with a massive built-in library of Genesis games, the bulkiness of the Nomad combined with Sega's relative indifference left the handheld with little room to truly take off. Number 12, The Wonderswan. The Wonderswan was truly something special. For a time, it seemed like it could at least exist as a viable alternative to Nintendo, but it just wasn't meant to be. The system was developed by Bandai and led by the legendary Gunpai Yokoi, the designer behind the Game & Watch series and co-creator of the Game Boy. Yokoi would die tragically in a car accident in 1997, two years before the release of the Wonder Swan in Japan in 1999. Rest in peace, you legend. The Wonderswan did okay on the sales front, amassing 3.5 million sales over a lifetime that expanded to the Wonderswan Color in 2000, and then the Swan Crystal in 2002. The system particularly came into its own with the addition of Color, featuring fantastic games like Front Mission and Judgment Silver Sword. With a price tag of just 4,800 yen for the original system, 6,800 yen for the Color version, the Wonderswan was very competitively priced. 
Unfortunately, the Wonderswan never left Japan, so we will never truly know just how successful it could have been. Worse yet, even with good games and a dedicated fanbase, it simply wasn't enough to get ahead of the Game Boy Advance. Number 11. The Sega Game Gear by the time the Sega Game Gear was released in 1990 in Japan, 1991 in the US and Europe, and in Australia in 1992, Sega's rivalry with Nintendo was in full swing. There's no doubt in anyone's mind that the 8-bit color Game Gear was designed to be superior to the Game Boy at every turn. Even the commercials reflected just how much fun it would theoretically be to play your favorite Sega games on a portable console in living color. And that was sort of the problem with the Game Gear, beyond the thing eating batteries like they were going out of style. While the system would see some good games, most of its releases were average at best ports of pre-existing Sega games. Even if the Game Gear did pretty well with over 10 million in sales, that's a very, very, very long way from the Game Boy with 118 million. Excellent games like Road Rash, Vampire Master of Darkness, Rystar and Sonic the Hedgehog just weren't enough to save the Game Gear from being discontinued in 1997. The Game Gear was my first ever handheld and I loved that boy like a baby boy. I didn't like needing to get a lamp in order to see anything that was going on, don't get me wrong, but I still loved it all the same. What was your first handheld? Let me know down below. Number 10. The Neo Geo Pocket Color it's here, the revolutionary Neo Geo Pocket Color. With 16-bit power, linked to the Sega Dreamcast. Revolving joystick. Despite its failure to capitalize on its unique features, such as replacing the D-pad with a joystick, which was unheard of in those days, the Neo Geo Pocket Color from SNK was a decidedly fun effort. Released in 1999 as a successor to the Neo Geo Pocket, this wondrous little marvel saw several good games for a system that looked and played exceptionally well. Metal Slug, Second Mission, SNK vs Capcom, Match of the Millennium and Poyo Pop are among the reasons why the NGPC is one of the most underrated handhelds of all time. Unfortunately, the Neo Geo Pocket Color just couldn't dent the market dominance Nintendo still had by the end of the 90s. Pokemon was a pretty big part of that, but the Game Boy Color was going strong with plenty of other releases, and the Game Boy Advance was right around the corner. Still, let's take stock of a system that had a 40-hour battery lifespan, could sync up with your Dreamcast, was pretty affordable at $69.95, and was even region-free. SNK's woes in the wake of the system's release didn't help the pocket color either, and the company's new owners Aruze didn't really care about supporting the handheld. And that really is just a giant shame. Number 9. The Steam Deck Released in 2022, the Steam Deck is easily one of the younger systems on our ranking. Clearly, it's accomplished a lot over just the past couple of years, leaping ahead of everything we've covered so far, and that's not entirely because of Vampire Survivors. While the true legacy of the Steam Deck and the improved recent OLED model release remains to be seen, Gabe Newell's Big Baby Boy has already proven itself to be a viable alternative to the Nintendo Switch. Featuring trackpads, an excellent touchscreen, and even the presence of back buttons that nobody uses, do you use them? Let me know. We're basically talking about a portable mini PC. The only thing that's really keeping the Steam Deck from true greatness is its battery life, but this of course depends on which games you're playing. With a few settings tweaks, you can easily extend your Steam Deck's battery for hours on a number of indie games. It's the big, beautiful AAA epics that are a little harder to manage for extended on-the-go play. The OLED version features a slightly stronger battery and better power efficiency, but this is still a less than stellar area that future versions of the Steam Deck and basically all of the 10 million alternatives inspired by it will need to improve. The price tag is also a little bit steep at $549 or higher for the OLED edition, but if you're the kind of gamer who spends all their time and money on Steam to begin with, but their back and knees hurt too much from sitting at their desk for about a decade, hello it's me, the value of having that seemingly bottomless well of games to play while on the go is arguably greater. It's also become a mascot of sorts for the emulation community, as it's incredibly easy to turn the Steam Deck into a handheld PS2. Among other things that we will not name here for legal reasons. 
If you need a good place to start with the Steam Deck, be sure to check out our video on the best Steam Deck games. It's a <laughs> verified whipper. No bias intended. Number 8. The Nintendo Game Boy What can you say about the Game Boy that hasn't been said already? Released in 1989 and packaged with one of the definitive examples of the killer app in Tetris, Nintendo's Game Boy was a hit almost immediately and never looked back. Despite a monochrome screen with no backlight and some decidedly outdated technology under the hood, Nintendo aggressively released a wide range of original games based on their most beloved characters, as well as titles developed by third-party companies like Capcom and Konami. A seemingly endless array of competitors tried to dethrone the Game Boy in the 1990s, with the console eventually evolving into the Game Boy Color, but nothing came close. The Game Boy was simplicity itself, with games like Super Mario Land, Pokemon Red and Blue and Wario Land 2 offering a compelling argument to buy and continue supporting the system. And people sure did, didn't they? Combined with the Game Boy Color, which we're not gonna do by the way, spoiler alert, the Game Boy is the fifth best-selling video game console of all time. It's been surpassed a few times now, I will always have a lot of love for the handheld that brought us to where we are now. Number 7. The PlayStation Vita We've said it before and we will say it again. Being a Vita stan is like being in a version of Fight Club except you only ever want to talk about Fight Club. And by extension, Invisimals. Okay, maybe not that one. We had such high hopes for the successor to the PlayStation Portable. The fact that it still fares so well against so many excellent handheld consoles speaks volumes of what it achieved in the few years that Sony bothered to offer it genuine support. Because while the PS Vita lasted 8 years in Japan from a 2011 release and 7 years in the West and elsewhere after coming out in 2012, it really only had 2 or 3 truly good years where Sony really, well, gave a shit. That's just a shame really. When you look at the best PlayStation Vita games, which you can do in our very cool video, including Persona 4 Golden, Rogue Legacy, Uncharted Golden Abyss, and Velocity 2X, it's hard not to feel a little frustrated. Fans deserved better than what Sony gave them, and the PS Vita is something of a black eye for the company, but still an absolutely fantastic pioneering handheld that has so many ways of being played and used today, if you catch our drift. Hmm? Despite demanding expensive memory cards on top of the steep $250 price tag and an unfortunate lack of meaningful third party support, the PS Vita was a good system and we're glad Sony's last hurrah for proper handhelds exists at all. Number 6. The Nintendo 3DS Nintendo almost botched the release of the free on DS Kennedy, charging far too much for their DS follow-up and not really having any worthwhile launch games to get excited about. Despite this rocky start, the system would go on to a thriving run of nearly 10 years of some of the best games ever made for a handheld system. That list includes The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds, Super Mario 3D Land, Pokemon X and Y and Bravely Default, to name just a handful. The dual screen feature on the 3DS could have been a disaster as well, but Nintendo had proven the gimmick viable with the DS and it would do so again here. Games such as Kid Icarus Uprising and Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon proved it could be a unique and engaging element to the overall impressive design of the system. While mobile gaming continued to eat into the dominance Nintendo once had, the last pure handheld console by Nintendo managed to stand on its own and give players a worthwhile time that took a fair amount of time to really get cooking. The 3D effect also wasn't great, <laughs> no, but you could at least turn it off before the final drop of puke left your stomach. Number 5. The Nintendo DS The Nintendo DS ended the unbelievable run of the Game Boy as the name Nintendo put its weight behind. The dual screen handheld was released in 2004 in North America and Japan and in 2005 in Europe and Australia as a successor to the Game Boy Advance. For this system, Nintendo opted for mechanical ingenuity over something that could compete with the PlayStation Portable, which basically allowed you to carry around a portable PS2 that you could play whenever you wanted. Nintendo didn't concern themselves with graphical prowess overall, as the DS was somewhere in the middle between the N64 and GameCube, 
Although games like Mario and Luigi, Bowser's Inside Story and The World Ends With You looked gorgeous, but rather with design choices that would ideally create unique playing opportunities. Thanks to exceptional releases such as Grand Theft Auto, Chinatown Wars, Castlevania, Dawn of Sorrow and Mario Kart DS, Nintendo succeeded and then some. Retailing for $149 at launch, which was pretty good value for the time, the Nintendo DS had shovelware issues and weak third-party support towards the end of its life, but it's still a fantastic handheld. It's also the second best-selling console ever with over 150 million units, so maybe there's something to that too. Nintendo owed Noel Edmonds their entire kingdom. Number 4. The Game Boy Color Nearly 10 years after the release of the original Game Boy, Nintendo made the upgrade everyone had been waiting for them to tackle for most of the Game Boy's run with the release of the Game Boy Color in 1998. While these color games may look a little basic today, it really cannot be understated how the GBC not only improved on the aging Game Boy, extending its vitality even further, but also contributed some of the best titles to ever appear on a Nintendo handheld. That includes games like Pokemon Gold, Silver Slash Crystal, Super Mario Bros Deluxe, Metal Gear Solid, what a whipper that is, Shantae, Wario Land 3, among the many titles that made the Game Boy Color an essential purchase. No, no, not you. Shh, 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 shh. Go back to bed. Go back to bed. Shh, shh. It's all right. It's all right. While the presence of Pokemon helped the Game Boy Color in a very significant way, Nintendo ensured the system lasted well into the next century by providing strong first-party support with a commendable range of third-party titles that were pretty great in their own right. Even if some of the games don't look great in today's light because you literally need a light in order to see them sometimes thanks to the screen, the massive accomplishments of the system are worth highlighting and the games themselves are often still a lot of fun to play today. Number 3. The Nintendo Switch Nintendo needed to do something decidedly bold to get out of the hole the Wii U had left them in. With a lot of scepticism that Nintendo could even turn things around from their previous console's failure, the Nintendo Switch made its debut on March 3rd, 2017 in most markets. Proving that Nintendo's unique world and characters still had value to gamers in the modern age, the console enjoyed success almost immediately, backed by a much, much better marketing campaign than what we had seen for the Wii U, or not seen. By comparison, the Switch was considerably simpler and promised unique games, third-party releases and the ability to play the console docked or on the go with absolute bloody ease. Early reviews reflected just how much the Switch seemed to get right for the vast majority of the people who bought it, even if it still had quite a few doubters. No console is obviously perfect, and while the Switch's online capabilities, lack of trophies or achievements, and general lack of power as it moved into the 2020s are worth mentioning, they can't stop the astonishing success the Switch has enjoyed over the course of 7 plus years. When we talk about why the Switch is in our top 3 best handhelds of all time, Despite its comparable youth to other portable systems, we have to talk about the games. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, Fire Emblem Free Houses, Luigi's Mansion 3, Super Mario Wonder, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, Super Smosh Bros. Smosh? <laughs> Super Smosh Bros. Just the guys from Smosh just beating each other to death. Metroid Dread, it just goes on and on and on. And there's the third party support as well, with games like Stardew Valley, Hades, Hollow Knight and Dead Cells all flourishing on the system to provide arguably the best library in Nintendo history. The Switch has allowed Nintendo to carve out a truly unique corner of the gaming sphere, one which is largely their own, with the Switch selling nearly 140 million consoles at the time of recording. I mean, if they want to beat the PS2, you know what they have to do. They have to make a new F-Zero. I'm just saying, F-Zero 99 doesn't count. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, guys. The children crave F-Zero. The children need F-Zero. Number 2. Game Boy Advance The Game Boy Advance won people over quickly with two things. A strong launch library that included Super Mario Advance, F-Zero Maximum Velocity, hell yeah, and Rayman Advance among its 17 titles in North America alone, and the ability to actually see what you were doing while playing. The Game Boy Advance started strong and didn't really have any significant missteps in its design or execution of its release in 2001 all over the world. The headphone adapter and rechargeable battery in the 2003 SP edition would make a good thing even dang better. And that backlit screen, 
goodness me, that went a long, long way. Backwards compatibility didn't hurt either, plus the 32-bit portable powerhouse was also just plain ass fun to control. Play Castlevania sometime to see what we mean. As soon as that lottery win goes through though, sheesh. Production of the Game Boy Advance ended in 2009, with more than 40 games produced for the console in 2007, and just one game released to the system in 2008. What's kind of wild about that is that the DS came out in 2004, meaning Nintendo continued their support for the GBA for several years, even as their handheld future was on the shelves. With one of the most extraordinary game libraries of all time behind it, the Game Boy Advance is still a favourite among many. The GBA has been seeing renewed interest from Nintendo as a virtual console on the Switch, and the list of fantastic GBA games that we hope to see released to that is a long, 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 long one. But you can't listen to Yellow Card on it, so the only winner for the best handheld of all time has to be number one, the PlayStation Portable. An unusual pick for some, but not for us, for a variety of reasons. Seriously, we all need to agree to give the PSP its flowers, because we may never have eaten this good when it comes to handhelds. Released in Japan in 2004 and elsewhere across 2005, the PSP immediately established itself as a must-have handheld. Sony put as much effort into this system as they did into their home consoles, and it showed in almost every aspect of its design. And in terms of the utterly staggering list of fantastic games, the console received over a period of nearly 10 years. But it wasn't just a matter of the PSP having bangers like Final Fantasy Tactics, The War of the Lions, Metal Gear Solid, Peace Walker and Patapon. You could watch movies, listen to music and even record video in 2005. You could also use a fairly competent web browser on it as well for definitely looking up Vice City cheats and nothing else. Nothing else. It's still absolutely crazy to look back on now. The PSP was ambitious and it still leaves you a little awestruck to see just how well Sony stuck the landing on this little marvel. It really is just a condensed PS2 that would also get a lot of the same software support as the PS3. You could even stream your PS3 games to your PSP. I mean, you wouldn't want to and it wouldn't work a lot of the time, but you could do it sort of technically. You even had backwards compatibility with the PS1 in the form of digital downloads, which had barely been done before. Surely it took 18 years and 16 carrier pigeons to make it work, but it's still incredible to look back on. Keep in mind, all of this was done in a time before smartphones. Nintendo may dominate this list and the sales rankings, but as far as we're concerned, no one has ever made a portable console quite like the PlayStation Portable. <laughs> Sam Jones 4618 says, Crash Team Racing is always overlooked, better than Mario Kart. That might be, my friend, but none of them are quite racing with Ryan, are they? Checkmate. And that was our list for the best handhelds of all time. I'm feeling a lot better now. I'm definitely pretty lucid. I'm glad I didn't do anything crazy like putting the end gauge on here. <laughs> what? What do you mean? That was definitely a lot of talking, and I still feel a little bit ill, so now I'm going to go and lie down. What did you think of the list? What was too high? What was too low? Be sure to let us know down below. And thank you for watching.